Thank you for joining us today. My name is Stephanie Arbetter, and I am a member of the DC JNF Future Board and a proud Root Society donor. Before we get to our special guests, I want to thank a moment, take a moment to thank all of our donors on the call who have supported Jewish National Fund's 2020 campaign, which ends in just two weeks. It is thanks to you that JNF is able to continue to invest in and develop Israel to secure its future as the Jewish state. While today we're discussing anti-Semitism and anti-Zionism, and so often we're faced with it in our day-to-day -day lives, Jewish National Fund provides a space to be a proud Zionist and to take action in supporting Israel. For those of you who are not yet supporters of Israel, please consider making a donation today. We'll put a link in the chat box or you'll hear from a JNF professional later this week. With that, it is now my distinct pleasure to join you all today with Alex Rivshin. A renowned scholar and advocate, Alex is an expert on the Israeli-Arab conflict and speaks to audiences around the world. His first book is the internationally acclaimed The Anti-Israel Agenda, Inside the Political War on the Jewish State, and his new book on the history of Zionism, titled Zionism, the Concise History, was released almost a year ago. I'll have it right here. Previously, he served as a spokesperson for the UK Zionist Federation. He is an author, lawyer, and member of the Jewish Diplomatic Corps. Alex serves as a CEO of, as the CEO of the Executive Council of Australian Jewry, becoming one of the youngest leaders in the Jewish diaspora. Okay, so let's get started by getting to know a bit more about who you are. Alex, welcome. Thank you, Stephanie. Great to be with you. So for our first question, as a child and teenager, were you always interested in politics and Israel's history? Or is there a particular incident that put you on this path to fight anti-Zionism and anti-Semitism? Um, look, I, I can't say that as a child I was particularly interested in Israeli history and politics, but I always had a very acute sense of my identity as a Jew. I knew, I knew who I was. And I think that really stemmed from my birth and upbringing in the Soviet Union. My family migrated as refuseniks and refugees in the late 1980s. And even though my personal connection to that place, to the Soviet Union, is very tenuous by virtue of having lived there for just a few years, but it's really a part of me. And I was very much raised on stories from my parents and grandparents of, you know, the daily cruelties and injustices to which they were subjected, the grotesque street anti-Semitism which they experienced in the shop queue and the trolley bus every day of their lives, being excluded from universities because of their Jewish ethnicity. And this all had a real profound impact on me. And I remember there was one kind of seminal moment that set me on my course where I was studying law at university in Sydney. And this was during the time of the Second Intifada, which was of course a very difficult time to be Jewish and Zionist on campus. And I remember seeing a group of Jewish students gathering, it was Holocaust Remembrance Day, and a group of Jewish students gathered together to commemorate the occasion, to light candles, and then I observed a second group of students meeting just near them, and suddenly unfurling a huge Palestinian flag. And that moment for me was when everything kind of crystallized. Those stories from my parents and grandparents suddenly had a modern relevance because I saw a familiar attack on the dignity of the Jewish people. And that made me, that compelled me to somehow stand up and to defend what I believed in. And I went and started remonstrating with the students and found that one of them was himself a Jew, the grandson of Holocaust survivors, no less. And that was really a, a time when I realized I had to do something. And I didn't quite know what the path would be from there. But I think that's of less importance because if you have the convictions and the beliefs and the values, you always find the path. And for me, that was through the law and through writing and advocacy and now representing the Jewish community in Australia and contributing through the books that I write. I love that. It's such a good takeaway for all of us. You know, if you have the conviction, you'll find the path. So I recently read your book, Zionism, The Concise History, in which you talk about the connection between the Jewish people and the land of Israel, sharing the ways the Jews maintain their connection to Israel, even without a land, through tradition, customs, and prayers. For those who haven't read your book yet, will you expand a bit more on this? Sure. Well, I felt that, you know, a story of Zionism, a history of Zionism, it can't begin with the Basel conference. It can't begin with Theodor Herzl and Leon Pinsker. It has to be rooted. It has to be grounded 
in Jewish civilization, peoplehood and connection to land. That really is the commencement of the story of Zionism. And so that's how I began this book, by explaining that 3,000 years ago, the Jews were a people, a people with a rich tradition and civilization and customs, with a capital in Jerusalem. They lived in a place where they developed their national traditions based on glorious battles and deep tragedies, a place where they developed the Hebrew language, their poetry and literature, and of course, the greatest gift to the world, the ethics that come from the Jewish religion. And so if one understands that the Jews are a people, a nation with national rights and with deep and profound spiritual and cultural connections to that land, you begin to see Zionism as an organic expression of this. And so if you understand that, if, if your understanding of Zionism is grounded and founded in that, then any contemporary accusations about you know, Zionism being a colonial project or the Jews being mere interlopers in the land and having no connection to it, they can't stand in the face of that history. So I thought it was very important to establish that. Um, and, you know, with the Jewish people, as you alluded to, when they lost their land, which formally happened in 135 CE, after the Emperor Hadrian put down the final Jewish rebellion, he then prohibits entry of Jews into Jerusalem on pain of death. He renames Jerusalem Ali Capitolina. He erects a pagan temple on the ruins of the Jewish temple and he renames Judea, Syria, Palestina. And that's really the beginning of the Jewish exile and loss of land. But from that point, the Jews, we've been very adaptable to our history. And they found ways to incorporate Zionism and a love of Zion into their daily customs and rituals. And of course, it's something that continues to this day. For example, the Seder commences with the cry of next year in Jerusalem, we turn and pray towards Jerusalem. And there are historical accounts through the Middle Ages and beyond of travelers passing through what was then Palestine and seeing Jews in humble communities throughout that land, wherever they were allowed to live, still returning to the crumbled ruins of the temples in Jerusalem. Um, and even though Jews were prohibited from entering in Jerusalem after Hadrian's proclamation, there were always pockets of Jewish communities in places like Tiberias and Sfat and the Galilee and so forth. So the Jews always found a way to internalize the importance of their land, the importance of Zion. And the modern Zionist movement, which really emerges in the late 19th century, is an outgrowth of that. It, it was kind of fermenting for a long period of time and needed the right kind of political environment from which it arose. And that was in the late 19th century. Well, so I, um, just as an aside with the high holidays and services, you know, coming up this weekend, it's just something else to think about, you know, the way that we've been able to hold on to these traditions for so many years. Uh, so uh, for my next question, we've seen a rise in anti-Semitism recently. What do you see as recurring tactics of anti-Semitism and what is unique about this recent rise? I would, look, I wouldn't find much unique about it because one thing that's evident from the study of anti-Semitism throughout history is its constancy, its consistency. And anti-Semitism has always attached itself to the dominant symbols of Jewish self-identification. So the things that the Jews identify by the most and revere the most and are most important in their lives and culture, that's what's been targeted by anti-Semites. So whether it's the Jewish faith, Jewish custom, Jewish community, Jewish nationhood, and of course now the Jewish state. Um, and what's really changed is merely the target of that anti-Semitism, the way it's expressed, but the undercurrent of it, the motivation behind it, the characterization of the Jew has remained incredibly constant. Um, the other interesting thing about anti-Semitism is that it's always framed as being some form of legitimate expression. So in early Christian anti-Semitism, it was expressed that Jews were racially and ethnically equal, uh, weren't inferior in any way. It was merely their beliefs, their refusal to accept Christ that made them inferior in that sense um, and worthy of condemnation and isolation. Uh, later on in the 19th century, when you have the emergence of racial thinking in Europe and a kind of class system based on ethnic origins and race, suddenly it was the fact that it wasn't the religious beliefs of the Jews, but it was their immutable characteristics as a race that made them reprehensible. And now we see anti-Semitism framed in the pseudo language of political science of international law. So now the most heinous objectionable things that can be leveled against the people are leveled against the Jews through the state of Israel. You know, that they willfully, gleefully kill women and children, 
uh, but it's a state founded in ethnic cleansing and genocide and apartheid and all the rest. So really, both in terms of the way that the Jew has been characterized as malevolent, as greedy, as controlling the leaders of power, that has remained incredibly constant, but it's merely the way it's expressed from uh, religious prejudice to racial and now through politics and international law. Um, the other interesting thing about anti-Semitism is that, you know, if you look through the history of it, whenever there's a period of great upheaval in a society, whether it's a pandemic, uh, economic upheavals and downturns and so forth, you always see a rise in conspiratorial thinking. And whenever that happens around the fringes of a society, invariably anti-Semitism isn't far behind. And so the fact that we are seeing a resurgence of anti-Semitism, the fact that so much contemporary anti-Semitism is expressed as a hatred of the Jewish state, uh, there's really nothing surprising or unique about it. Thank you for that answer. So oftentimes, anti-Zionists claim they are fighting for human rights. How do you approach the conversation about the difference between criticizing Israeli policy and being anti-Zionist? Where do you draw the line? Well, firstly, to the notion that anti-Zionism is in some way concerned about human rights. I mean, it's, it's a fallacy. Um, the International Covenant of Political and Civil Rights the first article of it talks about the right of a people to national self-determination. And anti-Zionism seeks to strip the Jewish people of their right of self-determination. So immediately it shows that anti-Zionism is absolutely antithetical to any notion of human rights. But I think, you know, people are very quick to equate directly anti-Zionism to anti-Semitism. And obviously there's a reason, a legitimate reason, I think, for doing that. But I think it's important to understand the evolution of anti-Zionism where it came from and how it developed. And that's why I, uh, I dedicated a full chapter of my book, the last chapter to understanding anti-Zionism. And it's a very inter interesting story because anti-Zionism, the, the question of support for or opposition to Zionism began very much as an internal Jewish question. Um, and you have at a time when, you know, the Jews are treated with unsparing brutality in Cyrus, Russia, in Romania, parts of the Middle East, in Yemen, uh, in Iraq, in Morocco, in Iran, um, there emerged these two streams of, of thought about how to alleviate the suffering of the Jewish people, how to cure them of anti-Semitism, how to protect them, shelter them, and protect the Jewish way of life. And one is, of course, the idea of a separatist movement, a national movement, and a return to Zion, which is, of course, Zionism. And the second theory about how to alleviate Jewish suffering is through greater civil participation, integration, assimilation. Um, and that block was very much the anti-Zionist group. And there was a constant kind of sparring in the Jewish world over that issue. And if you look even at kind of the defining figures, the leading lights of the Zionist movement, people like Leon Pinsker from Odessa, who wrote Auto-Emancipation, and of course, Theodore Herzl, they very much began as uh, committed assimilationists. They believed in the path of assimilation. And they, of course, had their rude awakenings for Pinsker was through the bloodiness of the pogroms, the Herzl is through the Dreyfus affair that kind of shattered the illusion that greater participation would lead to their emancipation and freedom. But I think it just goes to show that anti-Zionism had kind of legitimate roots. But then a few notable things occur. So firstly, the Holocaust proves definitively the necessity of Zionism. And it really makes mockery of the idea that the Jews could be safe in Europe through integration and civil participation. And the second thing is, of course, the creation of the State of Israel itself in 1948. And that ensures that anti-Zionism is no longer the opposition to an idea and a concept or a political movement. It becomes the opposition to the existence of a sovereign state, the national home of the Jewish people. And so for those reasons, anti-Zionism is really abandoned by anyone who cares a jot for the future of the Jewish people. And the only people who remain anti-Zionist are the Arab rejectionists, people like Haji Min al Hussein and his ideological successes, uh, the Iranian mullahs, a few renegade sects, ultra-Orthodox sects of Judaism who have their own religious reasons for opposing Zionism, and of course the hard left. And that really, I won't go into it in too much depth, but it really begins in the Soviet Union in the 1950s and 60s. And when the Soviet Union turned on Israel and the Jews in a massive way, we see the consequences and the legacy of that in far-left movements throughout the world. So today, anti-Zionism is in many ways indistinguishable from anti-Semitism. 
both in its hatred of a dominant symbol of Jewish self-identification and in the sort of language and imagery that it regularly uses. Um, but I think it's important to understand the origins and the evolution of anti-Zionism. But to go right back to the beginning of your question, there is no connection today between anti-Zionism and human rights. They're, they're really polar opposites. When Zionism is about preserving Jewish equality, Jewish rights and Jewish survival, anti-Zionism is against all that. So by virtue of that, it's against human rights. And I do have to reiterate, just after finishing your book, I think you do a really good job of delving into a lot of the history behind it. And then I like that you said, you know, how you called out at the very end, you do, you know, you kind of like wrap up and explain a little bit more about the, the anti-Zionism movement. So I, you know, I just want to reiterate to anybody, I think that it, it really does a great job. I was telling the team, you know, in our, in our prep call that it's crazy how much ground you cover in such a short, you know, within 200 pages, like the, the history of the Jewish people, but just in framing it, you know, I think I think you touch on some of the points and go deep on some of the really meaningful takeaways. So, um, you know, just have to reiterate that and, and thank you. Uh, we're we're going to continue, but I just had to, you know, make that point. That thank I think you, the, Stephanie. Thank you. It's very kind. Yeah, thoroughly ex explains it in a really, um, in a great way. So moving on, uh, um, as Americans and Jews around the world, what are some ways you suggest that we help the cause besides support Jewish National Fund's work in Israel? Well, firstly, I have to say the importance of supporting the JNF. Um, I'll, I'll, I'll go into some other things that can be done, but supporting the JNF, you know, one thing that became apparent in writing the story is that the JNF is Israel and the JNF is Zionism. And when you look back at the beginning of the Zionist movement in, in its formal organized sense, at the first Zionist Congress in Basel in 1897, they foreshadowed the forming of the Jewish National Fund and it was officially convened in the fourth Zionist Congress. So it stemmed from the very essence and the heart of the Zionist movement. Um, and when you look at what JNF does, both in terms of its achievements, in terms of land acquisition, land reclamation, support for projects, um, it's really phenomenal. But more than that, I think it connects Jews to each other throughout the world and Jews to Israel. So supporting JNF by being a donor, by participating in events, I can't recommend it highly enough. It's a wonderful cause. Um, but beyond that, I think it's vitally important. It all begins with knowing our story. And one thing that I've encountered through my work over the years is lamentably a great deal of ignorance within the Jewish world. Even those who have come from the Jewish day school system um, or, or Zionist youth movements, there's a great deal of ignorance about what Zionism is, um, why it was revolutionary, why it was radical and exciting and necessary and just and inspiring. There is very little awareness of this. And that's really the thing that compelled me to write this book. And I felt that by simply, without preaching too much, um, you know, by being honest and clear and letting the, sto the story unfold, um, every reader will come away with a greater sense of the wonder and amazement and fundamentally the justness and legitimacy of the Zionist movement. Um, and really, it, it begins there. And looking at my own Jewish identity and why I care so much about these issues, uh, why I'm so proud of my Jewishness, I attribute it largely to, as I mentioned at the outset of our, of our meeting, uh, the stories that I inherited from my parents and grandparents. And we live today in really what is a golden age for the Jewish people. And when you speak to young people, it's very difficult for them to conceptualize the fact that the Jews have encountered every aspect of calamity and catastrophe in our history. And that what we're living through today is not the norm, it's the exception in Jewish history. It's never been this good, and it won't always remain this good. And I think that if we tell these stories to our children, if they can understand that, um, we inspire and establish a strong Jewish identity, and from that will stem a desire to support organizations, be proud of our Jewishness and be Zionist. So knowing our story and telling our story to our children is the thing that I recommend the most, really. Thank you. And I have to mention that you are a, um, a father of three, so you already are doing your part in, t in talking to the next generation, educating them. Uh, so while researching Zionism, the concise history, was there anything you learned that surprised you or any stories that stand out? Um, look, 
at, at every phase of the story, and, and as you mentioned, I basically condensed 3,000 years of Jewish history into 250 pages, which was an ambitious project. But so much amazed me um, and, and inspired me about the story. And there are a lot of little vignettes, little episodes that are just truly remarkable. So, for example, you know, it, it's not all that important to the overall story of Zionism, but in 1946, uh, on a day called Black Sabbath, when the British forces in Palestine arrested thousands of Jewish leaders, uh, David Ben-Gurion um, happened to be in Paris at the time, where by chance he meets Ho Chi Minh, the Viet Cong leader in a, in a Paris hotel. Sounds like the beginning of a joke. Um, and Ho, Ho Chi Minh offers, he, you know, they form a bond of freedom fighters, and Ho Chi Minh offers Ben-Gurion a Jewish state in exile, in the, in the highlands of North Vietnam. And Ben-Gurion, of course, politely declines. He says, my eyes are firmly fixed on Zion and, and that's it. But there were so many of these incredible stories. I mean, one of them, one of the great episodes that it's really a seminal moment in the story of Zionism is Chaim Weizmann, uh, who would become the first president of the state of Israel. And he was a devoted Zionist and he was also a chemist. He lectured in organic chemistry at the University of Manchester. And again, by pure coincidence and chance, it so happens World War I breaks out, the naval front becomes critical to the success of the British and the Allies in World, in World War I. They're in urgent need of a chemical compound called acetone, which when mixed with gunpowder reduces the smoke given, on, given off by heavy guns, uh, which gives a distinct strategic advantage to the British in their naval battles with the Germans. And so they're desperate to find a formula for the mass production of acetone, and Heim Weizmann somehow comes up with that formula while researching into something completely different. He was looking into the commercial application of synthetic rubber. He stumbles upon this formula. Through that, he meets Winston Churchill, who's then First Lord of the Admiralty. He meets David Lloyd George, who's Minister for Munitions and would become Prime Minister. He meets a chap by the name of Balfour, the Foreign Secretary, who through his contact and conversations with Weizmann in this period, says about Zionism, it's a great cause and I understand it. And so through this remarkable set of circumstances, Balfour, uh, sorry, Weizmann ingratiates himself to the most powerful men in Britain, which then leads to the passing of the Balfour Declaration. It wasn't the only factor, but it was a major factor. So Lloyd George would say that his conversations with Weizmann and his war service to the British was the fountain origin of the Balfour Declaration. So just uncovering the details of the story was something. Um, and I mean, there are just so many instances, um, you know, that the founding of the Zion Mule Corps, which was founded by Joseph Trumbledore and Zev Jabotinsky after they were exiled by Palestine and found their way to Alexandria, where the British arrived by convoy, did these chance meetings. Um, but I think the thing that, you know, I also discovered a lot of obscure minutes of cabinet meetings uh, in the British Parliament where, for example, Chamberlain, the British Prime Minister, who was the appeaser, uh, who signed the Munich Pact, which allowed Hitler to devour Czechoslovakia, and then after that, conquer Poland and start World War II, where Chamberlain said that with World War II looming, if we're to offend one side or the other, the Jews or the Arabs, let us offend the Jews, because the Arabs are more strategically important. So just uncovering conversations like that was, was very interesting and gratifying. But I think to kind of step back from the detail, one thing that amazed me was the absolute consistency of the anti-Zionist position. So I've always been somewhat of an optimist. You know, a goal to my ear said Jews don't have the luxury of being pessimists. And I've always stuck to that. And I've always believed in the justness and in the viability of a two-state solution. But researching the story of Zionism, you see that at every single turn, there was unremitting, unflinching opposition to Zionist aims. Um, and we often talk about the three no's that came from Khartoum um, after the Six Day War, where the Arab League resolved there'd be no peace with Israel, no negotiations with Israel, no recognition of Israel. But you see that that's merely the latest iteration of those three no's and that rejectionism, because before it was uh, no migration by Jews, no land purchases by Jews, and no Jewish state in any territory at all. So you see how the opposition to Zionism has had nothing to do with uh, offers falling short of expectations or um, you know, an inability to negotiate in good faith. It was a fundamental opposition to the ideas of Jewish peoplehood and rights to the land. 
Um, and that made me somewhat more pessimistic about the, the prospects of peace. Were there any, this, this, was, this is a question that just popped up as you were talking and I just thought about it, but was there anything that um, you wish that you had included more of that you just couldn't, weren't able to fit into the book just due to the nature of, of space? I don't want to throw a curveball um, at you, but anything. No, 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 not at all, not at all. I mean, I, I think I went in great depth, you know, kind of from the origins of the Jews in the land um, and then kind of swept into about the 17th century in the Cossack Rebellion and the emancipation of the Jews in France, and then I went to the pogroms, and then the Dreyfus Affair, and then Herzl and Weizmann and, and Ben Gurion and the great leaders of the Zionist movement. So I covered a lot of ground. I mean, I was kind of always conscious of not turning this book into a history of the Jewish people or a history of the state of Israel. And even though the story of Zionism straddles both, and there's a lot of intersection between them, I felt that Zionism is its own story and deserves its own telling. Um, and some people have questioned why I didn't go into greater depth after the creation of the State of Israel, um, in greater depth about, for example, the Six Day War and the Yom Kippur War. But my feeling was, was that when you kind of step back from it and look at their importance in the broad story, the 3000 year story of Zionism, um, they're not really critical moments. They're critical moments in the story of modern Israel but they're really a continuation of anti-Semitism, of anti-Zionism by other means. Um, but so generally, I'm, I'm happy with what I arrived at. But I think if I had more time, I would have probably spent, I mean, every chapter in this book could be its own book, really. But I was determined to keep this concise and keep it readable and, you know, have it used as a resource by people for many years to come. I'll say one thing I was a little surprised about um, when when you went into the story about the actual naming of Israel. There, there's no record of who actually suggested the name. Yeah, yeah. Pretty great. I don't know. I went to Jewish day school. And I don't know how that escaped me, but that was quite interesting. Yeah, I mean, it, again, there are so many of those little stories where, you know, you would think that the creation of the state of Israel, this grand national project, um, two thousand years in gestation, that everything would be done in a very prudent orderly fashion but you see that it was actually very haphazard and very chaotic in many ways and the story that you're, that you're referring to there you know basically you have the declaration of independence and then they realize this country needs a name and there's a discussion among kind of kind of the founding fathers and, and the leaders and they look at a, a number of formulations Herzliya was one uh judea was another and then israel was mentioned and whoever mentioned it no one quite knows who put it out there but it was immediately accepted. Everyone knew it could have no other name. And there's a beautiful continuity to that because one of the oldest relics that still stands in the National Museum in Cairo, Egypt, that attests to Jewish civilization 3,000 years ago is this uh, statue called the Meremta uh, Stella. And it refers to Israel, the seed of Israel on that. And it's, it's the oldest surviving relic that attests to the existence of the state of Israel 3,000 years ago. And the fact that the modern state is called Israel as well, it's a beautiful continuity of that history and of that story. Amazing. So right now it's easy to feel down or frustrated. You alluded to a little bit of this before, but I'm just gonna reiterate it in a different way. Right now it's easy to feel down or frustrated by much of what we read in the news. To end this part um, of today on a more positive note, what is something you have seen or learned recently that gives you hope for the future? I think certainly what we're seeing literally right now in the last few hours with the signing of the Abraham Accord, the fact that the UAE and Bahrain have found peace and normalization with Israel. Um, some people are keen to downplay it for their own political reasons, but I think we need to appreciate and recognize that this is truly a historic moment, not only in the story of Israel, but in the story of the Jewish people. And when you look at the founding vision of Zionism um, and of the, the creation of the State of Israel's Declaration of Independence, the Basel program adopted in 1897, it was always envisaged and hoped that Israel would be accepted as an organic legitimate part of the Middle East and living at peace and harmony with its neighbors and all the peoples of the region. And the treaties with Egypt in 78, 79 and Jordan in 1994 were hard earned and, and were landmark achievements this is no less. Um, and one thing that's really pleased me as well is that whereas with Egypt and Jordan, these were very much kind of 
uh, elite agreements where the governments were able to agree for their own self-interest and whatever purposes, but that condition of peace rarely filtered down to the public. But what we're seeing now with the advent on, of social media and modern communications, including Zoom as we're engaging in now, there's really an opportunity for people to, to speak to each other. And after the UAE agreement was reached, immediately you had activists from both countries speaking to each other as we're speaking now. You had trade delegations immediately going over journalist missions, cultural and scientific exchanges. And what that does is it ensures that these aren't just agreements signed by leaders, but that feeling of mutual understanding and hopes for harmony and peace trickles down to the populations. And I think what we'll see is now that two countries have si signed and the Arab street hasn't exploded as, as people are very keen to, to foretell, um, I think you'll see more countries uh, following suit, which is a wonderful thing. Um, and I hope I still retain that sliver of optimism that eventually that shift in dynamics will lead to a peace with Palestinians as well. Great. So before we move to q and A, I I'd love for you just to discuss your new book uh, that you wrote actually during the pandemic. So you've been very busy this year. Um, it's, called, it's called A New Day. And then just to let everybody know, for anyone interested, we will be putting links to both books in the chat. But to wrap it up, I'd love, we'd love to hear a little bit more about your newest book, A New Day. Thank you very much. So it was very much a spontaneous project. I mean, whereas my first two books were many years in, in planning and researching and writing, uh, this really came about as a result of the circumstances. And I wrote it in kind of March, April, when my own city here in Australia, Sydney, Australia, was in lockdown. And I saw the toll that it was taking on my three daughters. Um, you know, not being able to go to school, not being able to hug their grandparents, uh, not being able to go to the park, simple basic things like that. And so I wrote a story to try and explain to them that a new day will come when we'll be able to travel again and go to school and see people and open our homes to, to our friends once more. But in the meantime, to, to really take pleasure in life's simple joys, to look around you and appreciate what you have, which is a comfortable home, a loving family, technology, books to read, games to play. And it's been very, very warmly received. I'm, I'm receiving, you know, letters from clinical psychologists in schools around the world saying that it's opened up conversations about what's truly important in life. It's built hope and courage and resilience in children. And like I said, it's not the sort of thing I typically write, but I believe in the power of writing and the power of words and ideas. And I felt like I needed to turn that towards this issue, which is really the issue of the day. Amazing. And like I said, we'll, we'll be dropping links to both books in the chat for everyone who's interested. So now with that, we are going to move into the Q&A portion. I, we actually will let, we'll let um, participants unmute themselves and ask. But first, I wanted to give it to Doran. She had a question, and I'll let her kick us off. Thank you. Hi. Um, really love listening to you. I'm excited to get your book and read it. And I have a small child, so I will get your children's book as well. Um, I really appreciated your last two comments because they felt really hopeful and optimistic. So I'm very, very sorry to turn to a um, less happy like question, but it has to do with social media. Um, so as we all know, um, social media, Twitter, Instagram, Facebook, all of it is just rife with anti-Semitism and anti-Zionism. And it spans, you know, the whole spectrum from the far right Holocaust deniers, like all the way over to the far left, you know, apartheid type comments. And um, I think the easy thing to do is obviously to tune it out. I deleted my Facebook, or my, not my Facebook, my Twitter for a little while, because I was sick of like comments about how Jews deserve the Holocaust. We're obviously not going to get into a debate on Twitter with somebody about whether or not the Holocaust happened. But there are other things that you engage in, like a friend of mine from college posted something on Instagram about Israeli apartheid. There are, I think, are scenarios wherein it probably makes sense for us to try to engage with these people. Um, but it can be really hard and really scary and sort of overwhelming because it is so easy to get shut down. And so I'm just curious for your perspective on if you have found or if you think that there's a way to be particularly effective when it comes, you know, to social media specifically, um, not just when you're having a conversation one-on-one -on -one with someone you know, but really on social media, 
how can we be effective advocates and how can we counter some of the anti-Semitism and anti-Zionism that we see, you know, every single day? It's a great question and uh, thank you for raising it. I mean, firstly, to, to what you began with, with the sheer hatred uh, and anti-Semitism, Holocaust denial, everything else that you see, uh, it's very demoralizing. It's hard to see that. And I, in my line of work, have been seeing it for years and years and years, and it still shocks me. Um, and I think the one thing that social media has done, um, it's revealed a lot of what society thinks. And it's very easy to live in our own blissful existences in our own communities and be oblivious to what goes on out there and what a lot of people are thinking. And these views do exist in our society and, and it's jarring and it's confronting. Um, but I think it, it kind of, sometimes it's not a bad thing to be reminded of this, uh, to be reminded of what it means to be a Jew. Uh, that one of the aspects of the Jewish condition is to be hated. That's not all there is to it, thankfully. There's much more to it, but we have always been hated. We will always be hated, um, sadly. So um, it, it's confronting, but I think it's necessary to understand that as well. In terms of actual engagement, certainly with people of, of that type, I wouldn't waste my time or breath. Um, but you quite rightly point out there are a lot of constructive, positive conversations and opportunities that can be had on social media which stem from comments that are critical of Israel, sometimes extremely critical of Israel. And I think we, we should take the opportunity to engage. There always has to be like a threshold question because you can't swing at every pitch. You can't engage with every Facebook comment and post. Um, but I think personally, when I see, for example, if it's a prominent account with a lot of followers, I'll engage with them. And I engage with them less to convert the person themselves but for the people who are following them and are following the conversation, I think that's got to be your target. So in terms of uh, an approach, I think first you need to ask yourself the question, is this person worthy of engaging with? Firstly, through their following and secondly, through the views they espouse. Is it worthy of it? Is it worthwhile? I think it's also very important to keep your cool. Um, you know, these are very emotive subjects for us. You know, we deeply love the Jewish people. We're concerned for the state of Israel and to see Israel slandered it's not merely a political expression. For us, it's deeply personal and it hurts us. But I think if you keep your cool, you can therefore think rationally, construct arguments, and with a mind to the audience you're trying to reach, I think you can come up with something that's persuasive. Um, and that also comes back to what I was saying before about knowing the history, knowing the facts and arguments, and understanding at which point to come in. So if you're dealing with an audience that's, for example, religiously Christian, you might level a certain set of arguments. If it's a very secular audience, a left-wing audience, you might present a different side of arguments. You might talk about the fact that when Israel was founded, it had the support of every communist party in the world because they viewed Israel as an organic expression of self-determination. So there are things, if you know the story, and hopefully the book arms people a little bit and gives them confidence, there's a lot of things that you can come out with. Thank you so much. It's really Thank helpful. You. And it makes it feel a little bit less intimidating and overwhelming to engage. Right. Thank you. We have time for one, for I guess a couple of more. Um, so Adam Slotnick submitted one to the chat, but Adam, if you want to ask it, you are more than welcome to unmute yourself and ask it, or I can go ahead and do it for you. Thank you. And thank you, Alex, for the presentation. Um, how do you think that the Abraham Accords, beginning with the UAE today in Bahrain, um, will affect anti-Zionist um, adherents and movements, uh, specifically in the U.S. and Europe? I think it's a major blow to the cause of anti-Zionism because anti-Zionism has always been predicated on a denial of the legitimacy of the state of Israel uh, and a desire to isolate the state. So if you look at it in its modern form, um, in 2001, you had the notorious Durban conference UN conference uh, uh, in September 2001 in Durban, South Africa, where the strategy of the complete and total isolation of Israel as an apartheid state was born, and BDS comes from that. So the sorts of problems that we see on US campuses and in civil society, human rights organizations, really comes from that. So anything that is a blow to this strategy of isolating Israel Anything that leads to greater integration of Israel into the region and into the international community uh, is a devastating blow to anti-Zionism. What I think you'll see is they will close ranks. They will become more activist in their actions. They will double down in their campaigns. But that's okay. I think the important thing is, is that 
people are drifting away from them and they're seeing now that there are alternatives to boycott and rejectionism and anti-normalization. There's a path of peace and cooperation and mutual understanding. So I think this is anything that upsets the Iranian mullahs and the BDS campaign, I'm happy with. And I think this is certainly one of those things. Can, can I just ask as a follow-up then and kind of jumping on what Duran said earlier, is it then when engaging with other people important to bring up what's happening uh, as far as these peace agreements are concerned? I think so. I mean, one of the challenges in advocating for Zionism historically or combating BDS is that we're very good at saying what we're against. We're against terrorism, we're against incitement, we're against boycott movements, but we haven't been that good at saying what we're for, what the alternative is. And with these peace treaties, you're seeing a very clear alternative. There's an alternative. The alternative is to sit down, to work out differences, to negotiate, to act in good faith, to deepen collaboration, people to people, government to government. That is the alternative. That's the path to peace. That's how whole societies can be turned towards a more peaceful future. So whereas BDS is claimed to be about human rights and justice, not only can we now debunk that uh, by going through the history of the BDS movement and its aims, but we can point to an actual productive alternative that brings hope and prosperity to the region. We have time for one more if anybody has a last question that they haven't asked yet. Anybody? Okay. Well, with that, thank you, Alex, for your time, and thank you all for joining us. Keep an eye out for our monthly JNF Future newsletter, which will have information about our upcoming events, or stay up to date by going to jnf.org slash on demand. Our next Food for Thought will be on Tuesday, September 22nd at 1 p.m. Eastern, and again at 12 noon Pacific. We will have an affiliate from Israel discussing JNF's impact on employment in the North and South. Also on October 8th, we'll be having an event in celebration of National Sustainability Day, prior to which you'll have free access to the documentary Sustainable Nation. I hope you enjoyed this evening's program. Thank you and everybody have a great night and happy upcoming holidays. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, bye. Thanks, guys. Great to see you all. You too. Shout to Allah.